Now, hello, traders. It's Thursday, November the 3rd. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com, here to give you a market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade, as well as an outflow of what we can expect in the 24 hours of trade ahead. This past 24 hours did have some noteworthy event risk, both in terms of scheduled and expected, uh, and the unexpected. Uh, we'll start off our conversation with the event that carried the most anticipation, and that was the Federal Reserve rate decision. That rate decision would generate some traction in uh, price action, but it wasn't necessarily what was responsible for this continued decline from the dollar index. You can see here that this is actually moving with considerable uh, momentum. In fact, here is a, uh, I believe this is a two-day uh, rate of change and is the fastest pace of decline that we've seen in a number of months, three months to be specific. So that is a impressive decline, but it wasn't the result of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve actually uh, essentially put a floor underneath this move and helped to level the market out. Now, I don't think this necessarily will define what the uh, greenback's next move is going to be, but it did give reason for pause. And that's because there was a little bit more optimism or hawkishness on that event than what was anticipated. So where do we read that uh, given the event? Well, first and foremost, this was a no change event, as expected, as heavily expected by most market participants. Looking at the actual layout for my scenario table. We knew we were going to be concentrating only on the actual rate decision itself and the policy statement. Uh, this was not one of the quarterly events that uh, came with forecasts for inflation, uh, growth, and employment, uh, interest rates, of course, and uh, the Janet Yellen press conference. That's going to be in December's meeting. So what we would generate or garner from this would be what they actually do this go around and what they in, insinuate or imply for the next meeting. They, in fact, held rates, so exactly as expected. The market was a little bit more generous with, it, with its expectations uh, than I was. I thought there was a 95% chance that they wouldn't move. The markets were giving it an 84% probability. I think this might have been in part due to uh, an influence of actual trading in the asset itself that falls outside of actual yield expectations. The markets were pretty uh, certain of a no change. And we can see that certainty of no change uh, because there wouldn't be an inherent risk uh, or dollar unwinding uh, because that uh, theoretical 16% uh, had to reposition because they were anticipating a rate hike. If that were the case, the dollar would have rallied, uh, or sorry, fell, but it didn't. Uh, we also saw that the dollar was falling before that uh, decision to hold. So it set the bar very low. A hold would not be uh, conflicted or met with a dollar that was extra extraordinarily buoyant. Uh, so there wasn't, uh, we'll call it excess uh, hawkish premium to work off. So we were in a very neutral position in the market heading into that event, and it came out as a neutral event itself. But it didn't just stop at the decision not to change policy at this go around. Uh, it did give us very tangible uh, elements to work with in the statement. But these elements, we have to look at them uh, specifically. From the dovish side, and for this we can actually look in the statement itself. From the dovish side, you could interpret that the fact that uh, there are only two dissenting votes at this meeting was a little bit more dovish than what it was in September. Why? Well, Esther George and Loretta Mester were uh, voters back in September that said they would uh, prefer a rate hike. So that is consistent. The absentee is Eric Rosengren who in September had decided to vote for a hike as well, alongside Mester and George. Now, if you want to play uh, absolute numbers games and not interpret why and what it can imply, that is that can be construed as dovish. But if you look at it in context, I don't think that this is particularly dovish. You don't uh, create market turbulence before a major piece of event risk like the impending U.S. election uh, and stir it with uh, 
a panic sense of uncertainty related to monetary policy by voting for a rate hike here and now. So I think that this was just a strategic uh, approach rather than a genuine change in standing and expectations. Now, contrast that to something that I think is, in fact, hawkish. In this particular statement, two things changed. All right, There are two specific stated mandates for the Federal Reserve. They promote uh, full employment, which is not zero, by the way. And they target a healthy but stable uh, pace of inflation. There is a unspoken interest in also maintaining financial stability. As for inflation, that has been the constant holdup for a decision to actually lift rates. If you re look back to the September meeting, they uh, gave a uh, significant uh, discount to their expectations for inflation, although they expected it to get there. At the moment, they saw that uh, commodity prices, namely energy, was keeping uh, inflation pressures depressed. This time, it was significantly free of those uh, moderating statements. Instead, they said inflation is expected to rise to 2% over the medium term. That is their objective. Now alone, I would not consider this to be something that would encourage a hike. All right? If we were at a median level interest rate, there would be no need to presume that this is going to be anything other than neutral. However, we start from an extraordinarily low rate. All right? This was an incredibly accommodative stance, something that they also have said. And to normalize when conditions are normal is what you would exactly expect. Furthermore, their concern about uh, global uncertainties has moderated significantly, at least the language. If you consider six months ago, the concern over China and other uh, concerns related to risk-oriented trends was far more prominent. Here, it's the committee continues to closely monitor inflation indicators and global economic financial developments. This seems like the language of a central bank that is clearing out its, uh, its path and is in turn intending to act in November, or sorry, December. And you can see that in interest rate expectations via the market as well. Looking at Fed funds futures, which I updated today after that rate decision, uh, we are now pricing in uh, approximately 79% probability of a rate hike at the December meeting. That is the highest probability of at least one rate hike since we've uh, been back in uh, March, early March. So uh, quite clearly this is a hawkish outcome, though it does not necessarily generate too much traction on the dollar because we uh, have largely expected such an outcome, uh, and it hasn't uh, significantly undermined risk trends, which is interesting considering that risk trends were already unstable, as is going into the event. The reality of the situation is that we anticipated this. The markets are uh, increasingly more uh, certain that there's going to be a rate hike, and there is something out there that's distracting us more effectively than our preoccupation with uh, the degrees of extreme accommodation from central banks, and that is the U.S. presidential election, which we talked about in yesterday's strategy video. This is going to remain uh, on the top headline in traders' minds. So this was inevitably going to be one of those events that uh, would struggle for influence. It should be said, however, that this will be a theme that we absolutely come back around to. Uh, after the election, uh, speculation over uh, the Fed's intentions on December 14th are going to come back in a very significant way, not just for the dollar, but also for broader risk trends. So don't write it off as a theme just because we didn't get volatility here and now. This will be something that motivates the markets once again when we don't have more pressing issues to be concerned with. Now, as for risk trends, uh, obviously this has been a pretty uh, remarkable uh, uh, mood in the market. The slide in risk-oriented assets, which we can look across uh, the various uh, assets that uh, I think fit the bill, uh, we have seen a pretty impressive decline. Note that uh, the carry trade uh, index here, uh, which on the trading view charts is DBV, uh, has held up pretty well. Others, not so much. This is a pretty uniform risk-oriented move. 
I'm keeping close, close tabs on the S&P 500, or in this case, it's proxy, the ETF, uh, Spider ETF, because this is the the most uh, aggressive, the most complacent, the most insistent on maintaining that risk buoyancy. In reality, however, if this gives, then it is definitely in indicative of a more systemic view of risk aversion. So should we be looking at levels or should we be looking at trend? I still prefer trend and I still prefer uh, evidence that it is spanning multiple asset classes, which it is. So I'm watching the S&P 500 or Spider ETF proxy. Uh, this is uh, dropping down 2100, below 2100, or the equivalency of 209 uh, on the Spider ETF. Uh, the Emerging Market ETF has slipped its own technical boundary, although I do think that uh, that shouldn't be treated as uh, laser accurate. The high yield ETF continues to burn. That is a very impressive move to the downside. Uh, commodities as a risk asset class are also slipping. Nope, that's not the right one. There you go. Of course, this really is representative heavily of oil. We'll look at that independently in just a second. But uh, the risk orientation has also had its uh, profound influences on the likes of Aussie dollar, however not as consistent, especially when we have to make the critical choice of a move to the downside here would insinuate a major break. The yen crosses have also felt this influence. My Aussie yen has uh, definitely hit its first target, which is good, trailing up to stop already. Uh, and I'll see if it can get bound back, back down to the bottom of the range. I'm not necessarily looking for a break below 78. Uh, if that is, and it does happen, it's a separate trade. Uh, but the yen crosses are lining up nicely to this development. This is going to be a little bit of a conflict between what is in charge, dollar or risk trends, uh, but absolutely those two can align. Risk aversion, if it does threaten interest rate expectations, would uh, double up on the influence for dollar yen to drop. But we saw some other yen crosses, euro yen, uh, pound yen, uh, continue their more modest declines. This is very similar to what I just showed on the, uh, the carry trade index, which is a little bit more reserved than its uh, other risk counterparts. So risk aversion is still the prevailing trend. All right, it is still the driving wind, but it is certainly uh, not going into that full scale tip over into uh, fear or deleveraging. Can it? Yes. But we should not uh, insist that it's going to happen. We shouldn't presume that that is inevitable. Keep close tabs on this. If you, if you intend to take trades on a risk-oriented trend, remember, this is a theme on a much bigger time scale, a weekly chart, if you will, not a four-hour chart. And if this is a weekly in, uh, opportunity uh, or a higher time frame opportunity, we don't have to just wait for uh, the most immediate short-term break. We need to look for something that really looks like a genuine move, and that's worth getting confirmation on. All right? Not just that you broke a level, but that there is an intention to fuel uh, the unwinding. So risk trends will remain one of our major concerns in the next 24 hours, and it has been one of our main concerns over the uh, previous week. Other themes over the past 24 hours that were uh, surprising. Uh, not a lot of price action out of this, at least in the Euro, uh, but the German 10-year uh, bond yield auction that we had this past session actually flipped back to positive. All right, That is quite noteworthy as those yields jump back. This is a normalization of uh, interest rates. This is perhaps also an indication of something else that we've been talking about more so recently, and that is the ineffectiveness of monetary policy, especially extreme easing. There was also the U.S. crude oil inventories, which showed us a massive uh, increase in uh, crude oil inventories, according to the Department of Energy. 14.4 million barrels increase, and demand itself would drop. What would be the expected uh, impact on oil? Eh, well, as we expect with supply and demand, it would be a break to the downside. There we go. There goes that trend line. It would also break through 
the 100 day moving average. So that is an impressive move. This is a very important commodity and when you have an inventory figure like that, rumor and speculation about Saudi Arabia and Iran coming to some kind of an agreement where they couldn't in the past and that uh, line has been used very uh, far too often, it's not going to generate the kind of conviction that you need to offset the, uh, the fundamental driver. And we end up with a break like this. This is taking out some considerable range structure and this is going to unnerve a lot of traders that were dependent upon the sanctity of rumor. Unless the OP uh, OPEC uh, players intend to give us some kind of confirmation, this could be damaging all right, to oil prices and their steady lift through 2016. That being said, a weak dollar and a weak oil uh, give some offsetting influence for when it comes to the dollar CAD. You can see some very tight congestion. I would expect that one of these themes is going to back off. And when it does, the winner in this is going to help decide a breakout from this very, very tight uh, price action. So keep an eye on that. In the next 24 hours, uh, there are a number of things that uh, should be on our radar. Uh, the most prominent is going to be risk trends. Uh, but I would also encourage keeping close tabs on all this data, lots of data. Uh, most important of it all is the BOE rate decision. I go into detail about this in the strategy video today, uh, but of the four rate decisions that were scheduled this week, this is the most capable, this is the most uh, influential. Why? Because we expect this to actually end uh, with some substantial change. Not hawkish dovish, there's no insinuation of that, but there is going to be substantial enough change here because inherently we are talking about a situation which previously the Bank of England said they expect to increase their policy, all right, they expect to increase sometime this year, and we know that the markets are anticipating it, and this is also intensely speculated over uh, currency when it comes to the views of Brexit. I actually ran a poll and I asked people what their favorite uh, pound pair was to trade going into this. Pound dollar, number one. We recently had a break to the upside of recent congestion. We'll see if this can provide fall through or if it cuts this out uh, at the legs. We will see uh, and I'll, I go through the strategy in the detail in today's strategy video. Now, uh, last couple of things, the ISM service sector PMI, watch that very closely. This accounts for t uh, three quarters of the U.S. economy, All right, very important. And also, since we are so Brexit hung up, uh, we need to watch the U.K. composite uh, PMIs. Uh, also, a lot of people were talking about the Swiss franc uh, coming under pressure and the Euro Swiss coming uh, down towards 108 uh, and 107.50. There's been speculation that the Swiss National Bank is going to step in and intervene on behalf of this currency. I doubt that very much because if they couldn't hold up the floor officially, they're not going to try to do it unofficially and just throw money into a black hole. All right, so keep an eye on this. I doubt this is actually going to be uh, turning into a serious uh, concern. But if it does, uh, it certainly deserves our attention. All right, we'll wrap this up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets tomorrow. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.